informative program on uh, the benefits, I would say, and feasibility of Medicare for All and the other programs, the health care programs that our presidential candidates are proposing. You know, presidential candidates? Yeah. So what does that mean? That means everybody, you need to get out and vote. You need to get out and vote and do our jobs. 2020 is probably the most important election of our lives after what's going on now, right? And yeah, and uh, so we really need all hands on deck, presidential, keeping our congressional seats, taking back the Senate, and we were already starting. Our West Side Democratic headquarters is up and running. We're calling all over the country just getting people aware, getting people registered to vote, having people vote uh, by mail. You know, I mean, there's a lot to do. Our own club has Monday night phone banks every Monday night at the Peace Center in Culver City. The rest of us, there's phone banks every night, and we're having vans go out. We're going to Arizona. We gotta take that McCain, that John McCain seat, that Senate seat, that can be ours. Um, on behalf of our executive board, I wanna thank Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal for making the trip down a little early from Seattle. I mean, I guess, I guess most of you know she is a sponsor of H.R. 1384, right? <laughs> the Medicare for All bill. <laughs> yeah. And to welcome our, our hero, Dr. Paul Sun. <laughs> UCLA professor of Aluskan School of Public Policy, Dr. Mark Peterson, <laughs> who's going to really get us the inside story on all the different plans. I mean, he's the expert on this, so we're waiting for that. And we've got Mari Lopez representing the Nurses Union. I mean, uh, poor Deborah Berger is, uh, she's up in fire, fire region up north, and so uh, she's okay, so far everything's okay, but, you know, we'd rather stay up there and watch her house, and so right. Mari was kind enough to step in. I just want to also quickly, because we have to get on with the program, thank my fellow architects of this program, uh, Joan Gallagher, member at large of our board, Joan Gallagher. And our, our um, chair of our Legislative Action Committee, Elena Ong. This, whoops, oh, thank you. This wouldn't have happened. Also, Ingrid Van Eckert, our VP Operations, who's always there, which, yes, yes, Ingrid. <laughs> always putting this all together for us. And the rest of our board, thank you, thank you. Raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. We really appreciate it. Uh, just a couple of other things in the back. We've got uh, Tracy Gore, who is our membership chair, and uh, we all we need everybody, everybody, all hands on deck because we have so much work to do. It's up to all of you to get it done and to help us be able to keep doing programs like this. Um, just to let you know, in November we're doing a great political film. You'll all be hearing about it. In December we're having our holiday party on December 14th, again at the Lantern House, our favorite venue in Venice. And uh, you're all welcome to join us. And I think that may be it. Oh yes, and of course, next year we've got lots of, we've got uh, candidate forums. We have a lot going on to get ready for the election in March. Can you believe it? So get ready. Uh, the, the order of today, we will have our speakers, where uh, Paul is our moderator. After our speakers, we will have a pretty intense question and answer period. Um, we have cards. I don't know if you all took the cards when you checked in, but if you think of a question, raise your hand and Joan or Elena will come walking around and uh, give you a card and then we'll collect them for the Q&A. And of course, after the Q&A, we will have our straw poll just to see which plan 
that you personally would support? <laughs> Gee, I wonder. After listening and making, you know, an unbiased decision here, uh, and which plan actually you think would be best for the country? The plan for you personally, and then what you think is good for the country. So with that, I want to introduce my friend, uh, our moderators, I said, Paul Song. Uh, Paul, as you all know, I think everybody knows Paul, right? Paul is a major activist, political activist. He is a radiation oncologist. He is the president of the Physicians for National Health Plan. He sits on like boards forever, Campaign for a Healthy California, People for the American Way, Progressive Democrats for America, Healthcare Now, the Eisner Pediatric and Women's Center, the Asian Pacific American Institute, for Congressional Studies, oh my gosh, busy man. And he's the immediate past executive director of the Courage Campaign. So, yay Paul. Uh, also, personally, Paul is the grandson of the late Sang Dong Kim, am I pronouncing it correctly? Who was the first popularly elected mayor of Seoul, Korean, <laughs> South Korea, right? And Paul, kind of following here, was the very first visiting fellow on health care policy in the California Department of Insurance. Um, but most of all, Paul is a friend to anyone, anyone who has a serious health condition or health issues, who needs his help and support. He really is there for you. I know many people, myself personally, who've spoken to him, who get information and support from him. Uh, and you've got a legion of grateful people, let me tell you, and admirers just waiting in the wings to give you the support that you need. All he has to do is ask you, ask us, and we will support you, Paul. Come on up. First of all, um, we just want to say thank you to Kara and the West LA uh, Democratic Club for putting this organization together. Uh, putting this event together. And again, how excited are you to hear from Pramila Jayapal? <laughs> so being in LA, we do get, quote, a lot of political superstars, but I don't think there are any higher than Pramila for truly what we all believe in. Um, what's ironic about this is you would think that uh, Representative uh, Jayapal has been in Congress for a long time, but she's only been in Congress for three years. Which is amazing, right? That she has accomplished so much in three years. And so um, I just want to put in one plug. I am actually hosting a fundraiser for her after this event at my home. And the reason I, I want to make this important is she has come out as a staunch advocate for what is right in the world. So a lot of corporate influence is not really excited about her. And if they can do anything to uh, defeat her, it, you know, they'll step up. So we need to do that and show our support so we can keep her strong, uh, voice as strong as possible in Congress. Um, a few things about uh, Representative Jayapal. Um, she, before she ran for Congress, uh, she was very instrumental in helping Seattle achieve its $15 minimum wage. <laughs> She's always been a staunch advocate for immigrant rights, and right after 9-11, uh, founded an organization called the No Hate Zone, uh, which really was designed to tackle a lot of the, the bigotry that was emerging after the 9-11 uh, uh, attacks. She has been really a true advocate for those without a voice for many, many years. Uh, I know many of you probably saw President Obama's uh, eulogy of uh, Elijah Cummings, where he talked about the term honorable, and just like Elijah Cummings, um, Pramila Jayapal was way honorable before she became a member of Congress. Um, and, and I think the thing, that, the, the, the thing that my wife and I are most inspired by her is she shows how to show unconditional love to her children. Um, as uh, my wife had done a story some time ago on gender fluidity and, and, and the issues that uh, kids face, parents face, uh, and, and, and Representative Jayapal has been more than uh, outspoken and shown a true example of what it means to be just an amazing parent, but also somebody who just loves their children. And, and I think we can learn from that regardless of what our uh, gender of our own kids are. So with that, I just want to say it is an absolute honor to uh, introduce uh, Pramila Jayapal.
Oh my gosh, that was such a beautiful introduction, Paul. Thank you so much. You are an incredible leader, and you have been for such a long time, and I see the love for you in our community. I just want to tell you it's reflected across the country, and it was probably the best, one of the best days that I had when Gautam, my chief of staff, said, Paul and Lisa want to do something with you for Medicare for All and, you know, to, to really push these bold progressive ideas. It was a great day. So thank you so much for your incredible leadership on everything, really. Um, I also want to thank Cara and uh, the West LA Democrats. You guys are awesome. It's great to be with you. And I'm honored to be on the stage with a great panel. And I'm sorry we're missing Deborah, but she's been such a wonderful leader. And I wish her the best in, in dealing with the impacts of these terrible fires. Um, so I wasn't going to do this, but, I, but Cara asked me to just start with a little bit about who I am. So I'll just do a minute or two on that. Paul told you a lot of the story, but I'm an immigrant. I'm a proud immigrant. I'm one of. Uh, I was born in India and I came to the United States by myself when I was 16 years old. Um, my parents had about $5,000 in their bank account and they used it all to send me here by myself because they felt like this was the place that I was going to have the most opportunity and the best future. I can tell you that my dad as an Indian parent really wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer or an engineer. <laughs> I am neither of the, none of those things. Um, you know, I tried to make him happy along the way, so I've had a, an interesting pathway to where I am. But I guess for me, you know, if you have the opportunity to come to the United States with nothing in your pockets and go from that to being a United States Congress member, that should not be an opportunity to, that is only available for the few. It really has to be something that is available for everybody, opportunity for everybody. And so I feel this deep responsibility to do that. And uh, it was a real honor to, when I got elected, to be the first South Asian American woman ever elected to the US House of Representatives. <laughs> There are only 14 members out of 535 who are naturalized citizens ourselves. And so, yes, I was on the front lines of family separation when it happened, the first member of Congress to go into a federal prison and talk to 227 mothers and fathers who had been separated from their children. But perhaps the thing that makes me most excited to be here is I never wanted to be in elected office, actually. I've been a community organizer um, for several decades, starting One America, the largest immigrant advocacy organization in Washington State, working on a $15 minimum wage when everybody said it wasn't possible and it was crazy. We were the first major city to pass that, marriage equality, you name it. But what I realized is we need organizers on the inside as well. We need to be thinking differently about how we build our movement for justice across the country. And you can call it progressive if you want, but I would just say that my definition of progressive is we are the first to the best, the most just, the most equitable ideas in the country. That's what a progressive is. And so the last thing I'll just say is I'm proud to have been elected uh, the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus in Congress. And uh, we, have, we are 100 members strong, and that is 40% of the Democratic caucus. And you see, in terms of the bills that Democrats have passed, because majorities matter, 2020 is the most important election. We have to come together and make sure we win back the White House and win back the Senate. Uh, but I will just tell you, the first out of the first major set of bills that Democrats have passed in the majority, these are all progressive ideas we've been advocating for. And I give a lot of credit to the speaker for moving these ideas, but mostly to the grassroots movement for making them real. $15 minimum wage, we passed that. The most Progressive Dream and Promise Act in the history of our country, we passed that. The uh, Equality Act, we passed that. H.R. 1, the For the People Act, to get money out of politics, we passed that. So uh, we have a lot of work to do still, and it is really wonderful to be here. And there is no better issue to showcase the power of the grassroots movement than Medicare for All. And... <laughs> So let me just give you an enormous thank you. You know, you got up and you clapped for me and for Paul and for Mari and for all of us, but this would not, we would not be where we are without the grassroots movement that made this happen. Without the um, healthcare professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the business people, the you know, labor unions, folks on the ground who have made this a priority over and over again. And I just want to call out at the risk of 
of leaving out anybody that's mad at me later, um, a, few, a few organizations, uh, Physicians for a National Health Program, Paul uh, is, is the epitome of what PNHB has done, um, NNU, the National Nurses United, thank you so much. Public Citizen, Social Security Works, the Labor Coalition for Single Payer, the Disability Rights Coalition, a very strong racial justice coalition that we put together this year that has been phenomenal, women's groups, and so many more. And I want you to know that H.R. 1384, the House Medicare for All Act of 2019, was crafted in conjunction with these groups. Over six months we spent really crafting the bill that we believed would address the issues of our healthcare crisis in this country. And so um, it comes from you. It comes from all of us. And I had the deep, deep honor of introducing that bill on February 27, 2019. <laughs> And today, just six short months later, let's just reflect for a moment on where we are and what we've accomplished. We now have 119 co-sponsors on the bill. That is over 50% of the Democratic Caucus. And that includes the assistant speaker of the House. It includes the caucus chairman of the House. It includes the vice caucus chair, woman of the House, and many, many more of our colleagues. We have had not one, not two, because we're not satisfied with small numbers, but three Medicare for All hearings in the House, almost all day hearings. And this is historic in the Rules Committee, the Budget Committee, and the um, uh, Ways and Means Committee. Really historic hearings with incredible testimonies from physicians, from Adi Barkin, who just, there was not a dry eye in the House. Let's give it up for Adi and everything he is struggling with. And I now have a solid commitment from Energy and Commerce Chairman Frank Pallone for a hearing in Energy and Commerce. Hopefully in the next few months, we're working on doing, doing it as quickly as possible. And I'm also trying to get a hearing on small businesses in Medicare for All because I think that is a very important piece. We have the largest labor union coalition supporting the bill ever. 32 labor unions that have endorsed Medicare for All, including some of the largest unions in the country, SEIU, AFT, NEA, UAW, the machinists, the mine workers, the list goes on and on. And I'm going to get to this later when I talk about some of the myths. Don't believe that labor unions are not with us on Medicare for All. We have 250 economists who have signed a letter saying that Medicare for All is not just the right thing to do, it is actually the only sustainable thing to do for our economy. We have a wonderful new Businesses for Medicare for All coalition led by Wendell Potter that's putting the urgent voices of business on the table. And of course, we have you, the hundreds of, well actually thousands, millions of grassroots supporters and organizations that have been advocating and getting local city councils to pass resolutions. I just heard that LA, the city of LA, is gonna pass a resolution on Medicare for All, which I'm very excited about. Of course, I have to point out that Seattle was the first city to pass that resolution because, you know, I mean, it, it, it had to be. Um, but al also your op-eds, all the ways in which you're engaging on this issue, and of course forums and town halls that I'm doing around the country on this issue. Finally, the fact that Medicare for All has taken center stage in the 2020 presidential debates, and thank you to uh, Senator Bernie Sanders back in 2016 <laughs> for, for really making this not just a crazy, you know, out there idea, but a conversation that now several other candidates have also um, taken on. But obviously the presidential debates are also showing us both the challenges and the pitfalls that we still have to overcome. Perhaps the best sign of how successful we've been is the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been poured into trying to defeat this very good idea. Anytime you have to have that much money poured into defeating an idea, you know that it's a damn good idea. But I just want to say that in spite of all of that money that has poured in, I've been poring over the polls, and I am, not, I, I am somebody who believes that um, 
Polling is good for information, but we are here to lead. We should use our platforms to lead. We should look at that polling. We should understand where we need to do more education, but we should lead with our values and what is right for justice. Um, and when I've looked at this polling, and I look at it very carefully, I'll tell you, I'm kind of uh, awed by the fact that in spite of the hundreds of millions of dollars that are pouring in, it poured in, in spite of what TV pundits might say or even some presidential candidates might say, the reality is this is a very resilient idea that Americans still universally support in red districts, not universally because that would mean 100%, but huge majority support in red and blue districts. Independent voters are with us on this. And if just imagine if the Democratic Party could have a very clear, tight, pro-Medicare for all message, what would happen to polling? Because when you have that kind of a tight message and you don't have your own people attacking you, you'd be amazed to see where we could rise in the polls. So um, why is that? The, the truth is that healthcare is a crisis across the country. It is something that every American family faces or is facing with a very close circle around them. People are literally dying because they can't get access to health care. Some of you have already told me some of your stories just since coming here. And every year, half a million Americans are filing for bankruptcy due to medical costs. Half a million people, 500,000 people filing for bankruptcy. Every day, my constituents and people that write to me across the country because I'm the lead sponsor of this bill are writing to tell me about the ridiculous choices they're making. The choices between paying rent or getting an insulin treatment or a cancer treatment. The choices between raiding their kids' college funds or foreclosing on their home because they can't afford health care. And so they also see that every day their wages are stagnating because the rise, and we'll talk about this when we get to labor unions, but the rising health care costs are directly tied to stagnating wages. And they see employers who are having to pay much higher premiums for employer-covered health care. They can only cover some of that. Some of that is getting pushed down to employees. And so workers are seeing their wages stagnating, their health care benefits being narrowed because the plans are giving you less and less while asking you to pay more and more. 70 million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured in the United States and tens of millions more who simply can't afford their health care even if they have insurance. The numbers of children who are uninsured are rising steeply and you know Paul brought Chairman Cummings into the room and I just every time I hear his name I get a, a, a snag in my heart because this man, when I came in, was so beautiful and, and generous to me as a new member. And when I was fighting for family separations, first, one of the first people on TV talking about it, he pulled me down to him with tears in his eyes and he said, never stop fighting, never stop saying what you're saying. And I know that it might sound like you're screaming into the wind sometimes, but know that you are on the right side of history. We have to do everything we can for our children. Um, that was Chairman Cummings, and we, we have lost a great, great man, but he was a huge supporter of Medicare for All. He believed that we needed to do this. So um, GoFundMe has become the most popular default insurance program in this country. And the costs that we are currently paying are not just astronomical now, that would be one thing, but they are increasing dramatically over the next uh, decades. So today in America, we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. The most expensive. We are spending $3.9 trillion annually on healthcare expenditures in America, a number that is set to go up to $6 trillion in the next decade. And in spite of all of this, healthcare is still a massive crisis for all but the wealthiest in America. So the first question you have to ask is, why is it that other major peer countries can guarantee universal health care for half the cost as America and we can't. You have to ask that. And it comes down to the profit-making motives that are built into the current system, a system that is designed to put profits over patients, a system that has a very expensive set of middlemen that stand between you and good quality affordable health care. 25 to 30 percent of all of the health expenditures in the country go to administrative costs. Now, some of those costs are necessary. They're going to be there no matter what. But much of it is wasted 
on a claim system that requires thousands of people at these insurance companies whose only job is to deny you your claim, and therefore thousands of people at the hospitals or elsewhere whose only job is to fight for you to get that claim. That is enormous amounts of administrative waste. But the other part of it, of course, is the profit that goes to the CEOs and the wealthiest shareholders. Just imagine that in 2018 alone, this is a new study from Axios, the top 62 healthcare CEOs made $1 billion in take-home pay. $1 billion even as people are dying. So all of that brings me to two basic premises of what I believe any real healthcare plan that seeks to address this crisis must have. First, everyone has to have guaranteed quality healthcare when they need it, okay? And second, any real plan that seeks to say I'm trying to solve this problem has to address the costs of the current system. You can't just say, I'm going to let a few more people buy in, or maybe even you know, a decent amount more people buy in, but not do anything about the out-of-control costs and administrative waste and for-profit motives that are baked in. And that is why I am here to tell you that Medicare for All is the only plan out there that actually addresses both of those things. Okay, so let me just quickly tell you what's in the bill, what's in the House version, which is, which is a little bit different than the Senate version, but mostly um, similar, but there are a few key differences. First of all, we cover everyone. Everyone is in, nobody is out. Okay, healthcare is a human right. You can't say if you're rich, you don't get that human right. No, this covers everyone, and it makes sure that everyone has the same guaranteed healthcare. Second, we provide comprehensive coverage in HR 1384. So that includes primary care, it includes vision, hearing, dental, prescription drugs, mental health, substance abuse care, maternal health care. We repeal the Hyde Amendment because anybody who thinks that women should not be able to access abortion care is missing it. And your coverage will finally based, be based on medical necessity rather than what insurance companies are willing to pay for. I worked in public health for 10 years. Most, most people don't know that, but I worked around the world in public health. And I'll tell you that if we can get care to people when they need it, like early on, maybe even before they need it, preventive care, it is so much less expensive down the road. And frankly, I don't think all of those costs, savings have been calculated into um, the issue, that, uh, into the plans that we're looking at. So we want you to get the care that you need when you need it. We don't want you to worry about whether your hospital or doctor is in network or spend hours on the phone fighting with insurance companies. Third, you get all of these comprehensive benefits with no co-pays, no private insurance premiums and no deductibles. And you have more choice than you have with any of your current systems because with Medicare for All, the doctors and hospitals will be in network. There won't be the separation of in and out of network uh, uh, doctors and hospitals and no more private insurance companies narrowing your freedom and your choice. Fourth, we bring down the costs of pharmaceutical drugs by demanding negotiation and licensing of generic drugs. Um, if manufacturers won't negotiate. And we also have a very important global budgeting provision in the House bill that is specifically designed to take on these ever-expanding costs. And finally, and this is a big one, for the first time in history, we provide universal coverage for long-term care for individuals with disabilities and older Americans. It is it is past time that we take care of our seniors and folks with disabilities, and we also flip the default. So instead of institutionalized care being the default, we flip it so that home-based and community-based care is the default, so we can have our end of life with our loved ones and the people that care about us. So um, I see my time is up, and I just wanted to say quickly that um, I have here a number of responses to the myths that are out there. And I'm going to tell you what they are, and then maybe you can ask me questions later if other panelists don't speak to that. I expected attacks from big pharma and for-profit insurance companies. What I didn't expect is misrepresentations from, from some of our own Democratic presidential candidates. So we are trying to educate everybody about what this is and what 
what it is not. So uh, the, the topics, and I'm not going to go into each one, is first of all, the myth that Americans love private insurance. Um, not true. They love their doctors and hospitals, not their private insurance. Second, the whole cost and tax debate is disingenuous at best and deeply misleading at worst. You can't look at the cost of this system without looking at what we currently pay. And let's put the scrutiny on these other plans for how they're going to bring down long-term costs. Um, OK, that was the second one. The third one, it's simply false that labor unions don't want Medicare for all. They recognize that if you have a buck at the bargaining table and 60 cents of that is going into health care costs, that's only 40 cents for your wages. And so there is a direct tie there. And by the way, we don't want companies like, G, uh, like GM to use health care and take away health care from striking workers. And thank goodness for the UAW striking workers. Fourth, we can't bring down the costs unless you take on the administrative waste and the for-profit motive. I'd like to see the, the, the other plans being asked how they plan to do that. And finally, let's not use the Republican playbook and the for-profit insurance company arguments like Medicare for All would shutter hospitals or telling seniors that Medicare for All will take away Medicare as you know it. These are just wrong, and I can tell you why they're wrong, but um, I'm not naive, and I'll just tell you that there is nothing big in this country, not one thing big in this country that has been achieved easily. Frederick Douglass said power doesn't concede anything without a demand. We didn't get the right to vote for women. We didn't end legalized slavery in this country or send a man to the moon because it was easy. We did it because it was a movement that created the possibility of real structural change. And we can think about getting Trump out of office in 2020. We have to. But if we don't address these deep structural issues that have skewed our economy for the wealthiest and the biggest corporations, we will lose again with somebody else that is just like Trump. So let's fix this and let's build the grassroots movement we need to get it done. Thank you. I'd like to yield my time to the congresswoman. <laughs> <laughs> so how inspiring is she? Um, and, and wouldn't she make a great vice president? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tushin, well, right. that, that's it. That's, yeah. <laughs> So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the current state of our healthcare system and also a little bit of comparison just to give you some facts. And one thing I wanted to start with was this picture of Shirley Chisholm, um, who was uh, an incredible, uh, uh, she was the first uh, uh, African-American woman elected to Congress. She also ran for president in 1972 under the mantra of being unbought and unbossed. She also um, gave my mom her first job after she graduated uh, as a, my mom came to the United States as a refugee during the Korean War, graduated from Columbia Teachers College, and then Ms. Chisholm hired my mom. Before Ms. Chisholm actually ran for Congress, she ran some um, uh, low-income uh, childcare uh, preschools in New York City and hired my mom as a teacher and became a mentor to my mom. She actually helped my mom get her green card as well. So, so when I look at, at Ms. Chisholm and I see uh, uh, Representative Jayapal, she is the living persona of Ms. Chisholm, I would just say. Because Ms. Chisholm said this, we have never seen health as a right it has been conceived as a privilege available to only to those who can afford it. This is the real reason the American health care system is in a, such a scandalous state. She said this in 1972, and you could argue this is more true now than it was in 1972 when she said that. So a couple things. I know every uh, other day you look at the headlines and you see something about either medical-related bankruptcies or people not being able to get access to health care. But this is something that I thought was really staggering. The fact was that 45% uh, of U.S. adults are concerned that a major health event could lead to bankruptcy and that it was estimated that roughly in just last year alone, Americans borrowed over $88 billion to pay for medical bills or something associated with that. Um, and, and the sad part is that uh, while the Affordable Care Act did some positive things, it just didn't go far enough. Um, as a radiation oncologist, I first became uh, keenly aware of the effects of uh, 
illness and medical related costs uh, because I saw too many of my own patients actually going bankrupt, particularly those that have been fighting long standing battles with metastatic breast cancer over say a course of five to 10 years. They exhausted their lifetime deductibles. This was pre-ACA paying out of pocket costs. And this is just showing you, these are recent headlines, that one in three cancer patients have to turn to friends or family to pay for care. Cancer patients are twice as likely to declare bankruptcy. Uh, and this is, and most of these patients have insurance. And I just wanna point out this, everyone is focused so much on the uninsured, but let's look at the insured, and that's the column on the left. The, this is just showing you that the number of people that borrowed money when they got sick from friends or family is 37%. Those that were unable to pay for food, heat, or housing was 34%. And these are people with insurance. There used to be a time where insurance was supposed to protect you from financial harm when you got sick. But what's happened to our system that so many people are having such financial difficulty despite the fact that they have insurance? Um, as uh, Representative Jayapal uh, mentioned, we spend twice as much as any industrialized nation. And yet we have lower uh, life expectancy. Matter of fact, uh, we're the only major industrialized nation where life expectancy has declined two years in a row. Uh, and the Economist uh, took an unprecedented issue and said what the dip in US life ex expectancy is really about is inequality. And that is so true, right? Um, but this is what's really staggering. Uh, not only do we have one of the highest infant mortalities, but maternal mortality. Look at, look at the um, chart on the, on the right. Um, as far as uh, infant mortality, only, if only um, uh, New Hampshire is the ranked highest in the United States, and it would rank 28th worldwide in terms of um, infant mortality. And when you look at states that are trying to take away a woman's right to choose and forcing them to carry an unwanted pregnancy, majority of those states have not expended Medi-Cal, uh, Medi and it's no wonder our maternal mortality is so high. So you can't be pro-life on one hand and then not care about the person that's actually carrying the child. Um, so just to point out that our system in our country is a hybrid of multiple systems. Ironically, you hear the term socialized as if it's such a horrible, horrible situation, but there are countries that have socialized uh, healthcare system. That's where the uh, government owns and operates every aspect of the uh, system. They own the hospitals, they own the uh, uh, the facilities, they own uh, the radiology centers, the labs, they employ all the doctors, the nurses, the cafeteria workers, the technologists, everything is in one system. We have that system here and it's the VA system. So it's ironic that the system that gets slammed as being socialized is the one that cares for those people that protect our freedoms. Um, we also have an employer sponsored uh, uh, system where the majority of you probably get your coverage through your employer and that's a system that closely resembles what Germany has. There are single payer systems, a Medicare system, and that is Canada, Taiwan, Korea. And then we have a, a system that is for our 30 million that are uninsured, and that is like Myanmar and Burundi. Um, so one of the things you will hear, it's sad that we're having, as, as Representative Jayapal ha, uh, mentioned, a debate within the Democratic Party about what's right. But as we go to the general election, we will also have this argument about free market versus socialism. Um, so in the run-up to the Affordable Care Act, I was debating Ron Paul quite regularly on CNN, and what Ron Paul kept saying is a government plan would be a job killer, and what we need is more freedom. Uh, so let's look at that. First of all, down below is the chart showing you that once the Affordable Care Act was implemented, what's happened? Job creation has continued to grow. So the idea that somehow the Affordable Care Act was going to be a job killer simply didn't turn out to be true, did it? The one then, then up on the uh, top is a, a, a chart from the Heritage Foundation, a very conservative think tank that comes up with the World Economic Freedom World Rankings. And if you look at every country that's ranked ahead of the United States in terms of economic freedom, what do they all have? They all have a universal government-run health care system. So somehow the idea that a government-run health care program is either a job killer or deprives freedom is simply not true. Um, if we talk about freedom, uh, it's actually the insurance industry that robs you of your freedom. They dictate what hospital you can go to, what doctor you can see, what medications uh, you can take. They also, uh, their networks are so narrow, meaning in your particular neighborhood, chances are you're only allowed to see 25% or less of the doctors in your community. So when you hear people like uh, Senator Klobuchar say you're gonna be, uh, they're gonna take your doctors away, it's simply not true. The private insurance industry is doing that every single day. Um, and then it's tough for employers too. So I, I, it's easy to really blame GM for what they're doing and I think it is unconscionable to pay their CEO a ridiculous salary and take uh, healthcare wages away. 
But this is just to show you that in 2018, the average large employer had to spend $14,000 per employee on health care costs. And uh, Charlie Munger, who was a very conservative, Warren Buffett's right-hand person, said, medical costs are the tapeworm of American competitiveness. Our cockamamie system gives our companies a big disadvantage in competing with other manufacturers. They've got single-payer medicine, and we're paying for it out of our company. And just to show you, this is from 2000. And eight above that prior to the bailout, General Motors was spending more on healthcare benefits for its employees and retirees than it was on steel to build cars. And then what did they do recently that healthcare benefits were at the really at the center of that strike? Um, and the other thing you, you need to point out is you know, the Affordable Care Act did not have any insurance rate regulation. And if you look at insurance rates from 2002 to 2016, this is just in California, rates have gone up 235% over that period of time, whereas inflation has remained roughly flat 40% over you know, 14 years, and wages remain stagnant. But down below, what's really harder, what people don't realize about, quote, this hidden tax, is if you're getting your coverage through your employer, you're being asked to contribute each and more and more every year of your paycheck towards your premiums on the front end, and then when you get sick, you're being asked to contribute more in terms of your co-pays or deductibles. So between the stagnant wages, insurance rate premiums going up and more being taken out of your paycheck, you have less take-home pay. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, these are some of the, the salaries that people got. This was 2016. I didn't have the 2018 uh, data. But when a time in 2016 where the average uh, salary in the United States was 43000 majority of these people were making two, three times that a day. Um, and then in the run-up to the Affordable Care Act, there were 3,300 registered health care lobbyists for the 535 members of Congress. $1.2 million was spent per day, more in total than the Bush-Kerry election, and that's why there was no insurance rate regulation or pharmaceutical drug pricing control. Um, there was no socialized me medicine or a government takeover. Private insurance was still kept very much in control. The Lancet, which is a very reputable medical journal, was so alarmed by what happened, they dedicated a specific interest to this. And uh, this is really uh, Dr. Peterson's, uh, much more of his area of expertise, but it said the healthcare reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the US government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence or the public interest. Um, so as a result, we, it did do some very positive things, but right now we have 30 million people that are uninsured, including 2.7 million here in California, of which a quarter are undocumented brothers and sisters. Um, and, and just to point out that our undocumented brothers and sisters do pay their fair share. And majority of them... Um, They pay property taxes, they pay income taxes, they get Social Security removed from their paycheck every month like you and I do, except they will never get to enjoy Social Security. And yet they, they are being demonized as if they are just taking from our society. Um, and this, unfortunately, because uh, of the assault since the uh, Republicans took over the both houses, although we took the house back and with uh, the president in power, is our uninsured rate is now starting to tick up. But even before the, the tweaks that the, or the removal of the individual mandate and all the protections that uh, uh, were in the original Affordable Care Act, it should just be pointed out, because we did not control insurance rates, uh, if you look from 2015 to 2017, the number of people that said they can no longer afford their premiums or having difficulty has increased by 27% to 37%. And on the right-hand side, the number of people who report they can't uh, have trouble with their deductibles has also increased to now 43%. So, because of that, this is a term that people don't pay enough attention to is the underinsured, the number of people who can't afford their co-pays and deductibles, so they delay seeking care because they simply can't do that. And if you have a bronze plan where your insurance deductible is, say, $6,800, the majority of people don't have that kind of money sitting around. And what that means is if you feel a lump in your neck, you've got to pay for the initial office visit, the biopsies, the, the scans everything before the insurance company even starts to kick in their 60% payment. So as a result, a lot of people are delaying seeking care. So when you hear candidates say, I'm for universal care because they can't say they're for Medicare for all, having uh, care or having access to um, uh, coverage doesn't mean squat because it doesn't necessarily mean you have access to care. And let's not forget, because we didn't have the courage, remember, uh, and again, I'm not trying to bash uh, uh, 
the, what we did. But remember, Billy Towson, who was representing pharma, was initially invited into the White House early on. In order to get pharma's support of the Affordable Care Act, they had an agreement not to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices and also not to do any real pharmaceutical drug pricing control. And look what we're paying for now. In 2016, 45 million Americans reported that they didn't fill a prescription because it was too high. Right now, 22% of every senior seniors don't fill a prescription. Uh, and one third of uh, US Americans uh, say that their drug prices are just too much of a, a burden on their household. Um, and then as far as Medi-Cal, look, Medi-Cal has done some great things, but here in the state of California, we're 47th in terms of reimbursement. And as a doctor who takes Medi-Cal, when I try to refer patients to somebody else, they won't necessarily see the patient. So there's a reason why MALDEF has sued Medi-Cal here in the state of California, yeah. claiming that it's separate and unequal. And I think rather it is a second class system. And it, while it's better than nothing, we should be elevating everyone to the same level of care. Um, so why are we spending so much and getting so little? Let's just give you a real two-second uh, complicated, why it's so complicated. Let's say one year you're getting your health care through United Healthcare, and then the next year your company goes through Aetna, but then the next year you lose your job and you're on Medi-Cal, and eventually you're 65 and you get Medicare, and you want to keep going to the same doctor or the same hospital. Each time you go in, they've got to figure out who's your coverage, am I in their network, what's your copay, what's their deductible, oh, you can't see me because I'm not one of the doctors that's contracted with United Healthcare. you've got to go see a different doctor. And all of that time and energy that is wasted is time that's taken away from actual patient care. It's money that is causing uh, most hospitals to spend 25% of their budget on administrative costs. Duke University prior to, uh, it just recently showed that they had more hospital administrators dealing with pre-authorization and billing that they did, than they did hospital beds. So this is our convoluted system. Um, in addition, if you look at the number of administrators uh, in yellow compared to the number of doctors, and then the cost, and down below is a curve of the expansion of Medicare Advantage, uh, it's a coincidence that the curves kind of look alike, don't they? <laughs> and as a result, America has the least efficient healthcare system of industrialized nation countries. Um, and this is from a patient perspective. It says, the number of patients who reported spending a lot of time on paperwork or disputes related to medical bills. This, have you ever tried to uh, reverse a claim with an insurance company? No. So the nurses did a great study a few years ago that found that if you are diligent enough, if you and your doctor are willing to spend hour and hour and hour and work it up the command, that 50% of all denials get overturned. But what they're banking on and making it so painful and so disruptive that you don't take the time to do that, and then they, they just pocket the money. Uh, and let's talk about corporate welfare for a minute. Um, it was reported that of the top health insurers, 60% of their revenue now comes from Medicare or Medicaid. So when, when, you, when you talk about welfare, let's talk about welfare for these folks. Let's show that, let's give them a real work requirement. Uh, so if you had to do a, a, a diagnosis of the problem, this is, this is the major diagnosis, but there are some other issues. It's, you know, it's the middleman, as, as Representative Jayapal mentioned. Um, and then you've got hospitals that have become so powerful. This is a lawsuit that's happening right now in the state of California. Our Attorney General Javier uh, Becerra is suing Sutter Health because they have consolidated so much that they've been jacking up the cost of everything associated with care upwards of 30%. That's why a Tylenol costs roughly $40, cents, uh, $40 when it's only 50 cents to buy in a hospital, uh, IV fluids and, and things of that nature. So not only are insurance companies become, becoming too powerful, hospitals are becoming too powerful, pharmaceutical companies are becoming too powerful. Um, so is there a better way? This is 1965 and I find out I'm only, I'm three months older than the representative. <laughs> uh, so I was born before Medicare, one month before, she was born a few months later. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to divulge your age, but I found out where <laughs> uh, So in 1965, you know, Medicare was started when 44% of adults over the age of 65 were uninsured because ma majority of people got coverage through their employer uh, and one third of seniors were uh, living in poverty. And we've shown that it's a much better uh, system than the private insurance industry. Uh, just to show you that the average Medicare patient tends to be older, sicker, have more chronic problems. And yet, look what Medicare has done as far as keeping costs down compared to the private insurance industry. So when you're told the government isn't capable of doing anything better than the private sector, this is simply not true. This is one instance where we do it much, much better. Um, and this is just showing you a Stanford study showing that 
private uh, Medicare for Advantage plans cost taxpayers roughly 25% more and pay out 25% less per, in, per uh, enrollee. Um, showing you Medicare is unable to uh, negotiate drug prices. So in the last few years, Medicare Part D rose 77% in five years despite giving 17% less prescriptions. Uh, so instead of this convoluted system, I think a single payer system will do this. It will uh, eliminate the inefficiencies of a multi-fragmented system. It'll control costs by effectively fighting back against powerful mergers and consolidations to eliminate price gouging by hospitals, pharma, and providers. It'll eliminate the hidden tax that we all pay for in terms of uncompensated care, in terms of higher premiums and such. And it will lead to higher wages because if employers don't have to pay huge health care costs, they're going to need to retain talent by paying higher wages. Um, so when, uh, you saw immediately when Senator Sanders' bill came out, Fox News ran this, that it would cost $32 trillion, but on the same time they put a, uh, a poll on their website, would Medicare for All bill, uh, even though it costs $32.6 trillion, would the benefits outweigh the costs? And on Fox News' website, 73% of people said yes. <laughs> and, and just to point out how dishonest it was, not only in the Republican, uh, in Fox News, but also the other corporate media was, uh, they failed to mention that, yes, the Senator Sanders plan would cost $32 trillion, but if we did nothing, it would cost $2.1 trillion more. So they didn't discount. This was funded by the Mercatus Institute Koch Brothers study. It would still uh, be cheaper to do this while insuring everyone. Uh, and this is, as uh, Representative Jai Paul said, our costs are going to go out of control no matter what. Uh, and this was a study that was done by Jerry Kaminsky and his group showing that already for every dollar that's spent on health care, 70 cents is already paid for by us, the taxpayers, both in terms of the uh, health care we provide for our public servants, uh, our uh, pensions, also uh, tax breaks we give to Google and Apple and such. So we're essentially paying for universal health care. We're just not getting it. Uh, and I just want to uh, end on three quick slides. This is showing you on the left how quick the public opinion is changing. On the left is how public opinion towards marriage equality changed in the United States. If you look, remember, it happened so quickly. We were all here fighting against Prop 8, and then in a matter of a few years, it became the law of the land. And look at the curve for Medicare for all. It's very similar. And what's happened in much the same way that my good friends came out to their family members, their coworkers, their employer, uh, you know, employers, their neighbors, People are coming about the horrors of this healthcare system and how it's not helping them. So the more you share, the more people realize that. And as a result, the majority of people now think we're not getting good value. Um, and again, I don't want to steal uh, Dr. Peterson's thunder, but this I thought was very interesting on the top is they asked Republicans and Democrats, what type of influence does the NRA have on Congress? And Republicans said only 21% of the Republicans thought the NRA had too much power, whereas 73% of Democrats thought they had uh, too much power. But look at the health insurance industry and the pharmaceutical companies. The majority of people from both sides of the aisle think those two branches have too much power on Congress. So it is bipartisan and it's changing. Um, and as a result, now we have um, uh, majority approval or in, uh, for Medicare for all. Okay. Three last slides, I promise. So this is um, just showing you right to the midterm elections what was the most Googled term, uh, and it's healthcare in, in purple. Uh, and so in the run-up to the, uh, the last primary, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, uh, likened giving uh, Medicare for All to giving everyone a pony, and look at all the countries that have a pony. <laughs> <laughs> and so where's our friggin' pony? <laughs> And I'm just going to close by this. So this is Quentin Young, who was Martin Luther King's physician, uh, Barack Obama's physician. He was a leader. He, uh, he ran Cook County's uh, public health uh, and uh, family practice facility. He was just um, the most inspirational man I've ever met. He said, over the years, I've aligned myself with unpopular causes. I've worked to replace the worship of the market with concern for the common good, social justice, and tolerance. Over time, the American people generally do the right thing, and I'm confident they will see that national health insurance is no longer the best solution. It is the only solution. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, so with that, um, I am 
going to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, and, and what's really germane about this is Dr. Peterson, uh, he is, uh, his real area of specialty at UCLA is really looking at the intersection between the executive branch, Congress, and special interests. And if there was ever an area that has been dominated by special interests, it's clearly the fight for Medicare for all in the United States. Um, uh, Dr. Peterson, I've, I've served on a panel with him before. He is uh, going to be able to give you just a straight analysis and, and realistically um, uh, break down what the problems are. Uh, he's also going to talk about all the various plans that are here. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the distinguished uh, Dr. Mark Peterson. Thank you very much. I have to say it's a real honor to be on this panel. Uh, the distinguished colleagues I have on the panel, I was th sitting there thinking, my God, this is a representation of the best of the United States. <laughs> and and I, I, I also have a somewhat different role here as a political scientist and a health policy person as a president of a professional scholar. Uh, in that I am not here to be an advocate, I'm here to provide some uh, general context for thinking about the challenges that lie ahead, but I do want you to know that this is an issue in which I have been deeply involved. Back in the early 1990s, while on sabbatical from Harvard at the time, I was a legislative assistant for health policy for Senator Tom Daschle on the Democrat from South Dakota on the Finance Committee, and we did a major single-payer health care bill that I had the pleasure of participating in writing, S2513, the American Health Security Plan. Very interesting story behind that. In addition to which, uh, after coming to UCLA, UCLA uh, some years ago, colleagues of mine and I were the founding uh, team members of the what we call the Blue Sky Health Initiative that we did with former Vice President Al Gore. And if you think Medicare for All is bold, uh, we put you in the dust because we were going to design a system that was integrative, uh, comprehensive, and really brought together both health care and health in a lot of different ways, and that's a, another part of the story as well. And certainly there are an enormous number of things we can agree on. One is, and not to use any sophisticated jargon, as Paul said, the um, health care system we have is dysfunctional, it's expensive, it's inefficient, and it's unfair. It's a mess, and it has been for a very long time. I was very happy the way Representative Jaya Paul brought up the issue, as Paul did as well, of cost. We've got to talk about costs differently. We can't talk about costs only as taxpayer costs. We have to talk about costs of the overall system and the notion that we can't afford options when we're already the, sec uh, the most expensive system in the world by twofold is pretty significant. Uh, but I think it's important to also evaluate options uh, beyond just the substantive things, all the uh, things that I would certainly agree with. I've given these speeches before, <laughs> very similar in many ways about uh, single payer and, and plans like Medicare for all. But we also have to be, uh, at least if we're going to deal with the challenges, we have to know what they are in order to uh, move forward in the political system. So I'm going to bring together substantive features with political considerations. Uh, some of you may know of a gentleman named Ted Marmer, distinguished professor from Yale. He was one of the early academic leaders in promoting uh, single payer, uh, but also an academic leader in thinking about how to uh, pose challenges and address them. And uh, I once invited him to UCLA and he gave a talk that included the reference, policy prescription without political analysis is either silly or misleading. And the point is we have to learn from that. Uh, the side of me that comes to this as an academic, uh, a long time ago I wrote a book called Legislating Together, which was about the presidency and Congress and domestic policy, and very much about how, uh, across six administrations, how difficult it is to do big things in this country. Uh, presidents get roughly 50 to 60 percent of their initiatives passed, and on the really big ticket items, well under half. And so we have to consider that challenge. I'm in the midst of finishing a book uh, perhaps with the unfortunate title, unfortunate only because it may be too realistic, which is American Sisyphus, Healthcare and the Challenge of Transformative Policymaking. It is a very deep analytical dive across the problems, public opinion, interest groups, Congress, the presidency, the general political electoral context, the various options before us, leadership opportunities, uh, to understand why over the last 100 years we've been having this battle in the United States and why despite six 
previous health care reform efforts, including national health insurance, before the ACA, not a single time did any one of them even come to a vote in the House floor or the Senate floor. This is a big challenge, and this is why the energy that we have represented before you is very significant. Uh, many years ago, I was talking to Paul, Senator Paul Wellstone, who was our next door neighbor in the Hart Building, and uh, Senator Wellstone at that point uh, really felt what we really need uh, to get to universal coverage in the United States is a social movement, and there really has never been one uh, behind it, and so the question is, can this all be translated into that? So with that as